you don't know me by now, it's probably because we uh, haven't met yet and I haven't said my name. I'm Andrew Newland with Newtography, and it is so nice to meet you. All right, this is the first video in a two-part series about lenses. In this video, we're gonna go over the lens and help you understand what all the numbers and buttons and rings and everything mean and do. And in the next video, we're gonna go over which lens would best suit you when starting out in photography, based on the type of photography that you plan on doing. So, if you choose to accept this mission, abandon everything in your life for the next few minutes, and blindly trust anything that I'm about to tell you. Alright, so lenses can be one of the most confusing things to learn when you're just getting into photography. So. I'm going to make it as easy as I can to help you learn and understand everything you need to know about lenses. We're going to start off by going over the different categories of lenses. Basically, lenses either fall into one of two categories, a zoom lens or a prime lens. A zoom lens is exactly what it sounds like, a lens that zooms in and out. A prime lens is a lens that's fixed to one focal length and cannot zoom in and out. In these two categories, there's a few different types of lenses. A wide-angle lens, a normal or mid-range lens, and a telephoto lens. All right, now, to get started, you need to understand some basic concepts. The first of which is focal length. Focal length is basically the magnification of the image, and it's represented in millimeters. An easy way to grasp this is to try and think of it in relation to your eye. The human eye essentially sees at 50 millimeters. So if you were to put a 50 millimeter lens onto a full frame camera and hold it up to one eye, you would be virtually seeing the same image in both eyes and it would seem somewhat normal. So the normal focal length or what you can see through one eye is 50 millimeters. And anything within about 20 millimeters of that is known as a normal or a mid-range lens. Now, when you get below 30 millimeters, you're making your way into what's known as wide-angle lenses. Wide-angle lenses do exactly what they sound like. They give you a wide angle of view. So, the lower your focal length becomes, the more of your scene you're going to pull into the frame. You can go all the way down into the teens in focal length and still have a relatively normal looking wide angle image. But the lower you go, the more distortion you start getting in the sides and corners of your image due to the rounded glass in the wide angle lenses. This distortion can get so great that the further you go down in focal length, images start being referred to as fisheye because the image is so distorted that it no longer seems normal to the brain. Now, on the opposite end, once you get to about 70 millimeters, then you're venturing into what's known as telephoto focal lengths. These range anywhere from 70 millimeters all the way up to 1700 millimeters. Okay, to make sure you got it, focal length is the magnification of the image. The higher the focal length, the higher the magnification. These are all images taken from a tripod to demonstrate different focal lengths. The tripod never moved, the only thing that changed was the lens and the focal length that the image was taken. Now focal length does something else besides just magnify your image. It can also alter the perspective of an image. With a wide angle, you can make your subject look very large in comparison to the background. And as your focal length increases, you start to see what's called background compression. So the subject can stay the same size in your frame while the background becomes compressed and alters your perspective. So the long telephoto lenses really compress the background, which is good when you're wanting to take portraits of people because it does a good job of making the subject stand out by compressing the background and making it less distracting. You can see a dramatic change in perspective from these three images. The first taken at 14 millimeters, the second at 50 millimeters, and the third at 135 millimeters. Notice how the subject remains the same in all of the images, but as the focal length increases, then the background becomes compressed and the subject stands out more. Okay, now that you understand focal length, 
Let's take a look at the lens itself and understand how to read the markings and identify each lens. On every lens, you will find several different combinations of numbers and letters. So we know now that the millimeter represents the focal length of the lens. In this case, it shows us that this lens is a 28 to 80 millimeter zoom lens. Now, the set of numbers that immediately follow the focal length represent the aperture of the lens. If you don't know what aperture is, head on over and watch our first video on the exposure triangle. On all lenses, the aperture shows up as a ratio of one to whatever the minimum aperture of the lens is. So in this case, the minimum aperture of the lens would be f3.5 when it's at 28 millimeters and f5.6 when it's at 80 millimeters. The more inexpensive zoom lenses are made like this, where the aperture gets smaller as you increase the focal length. The higher quality lenses have what's called fixed apertures. This means that the aperture stays the same throughout the entire zoom range. For example, Nikon makes a 55 to 200 millimeter f4.0 to 5.6 lens. This lens costs around $200. This lens can't really let much light in with a minimum aperture of f4.0. And it's also made of plastic, so overall it's not a very high quality lens. Then Nikon has the 70 to 200 f4.0 fixed aperture lens. This lens costs about $1,000 and it remains at f4 throughout its entire zoom range. This still doesn't let a tremendous amount of light in, but it dramatically increases the amount of light let in at 200 millimeters, from f5.6 to f4. Then, once you get up into the professional line of lenses, you have the Nikon 70 to 200 2.8. This lens can let in a tremendous amount of light with a wide aperture of f2.8, and that 2.8 aperture stays constant through its entire zoom range. This gives you the highest quality image, best depth of field, and low light performance. But it comes at a price of around $2,000. All the more professional lenses will have a constant aperture of f2.8 or lower. Now also, on the front of the lens, we usually have the filter size, which is this number that's preceded by a little circle with a line through it. Now, I have to go on a little mini rant about UV filters. UV filters are pressured on you by every camera salesman in the world, and it is not something that you need. They say you need it, but you don't. They'll tell you that it's crucial to have it on there to protect your lenses from getting damaged, but that's ridiculous. That's like putting a motorcycle helmet on a newborn baby. If you take care of your stuff, and you keep the lens hood on your lens, you should never have a problem keeping your lenses from getting damaged. Now, I'm not completely against all filters, but you have to understand that your lenses are made of the highest quality optics in the world, and to buy a $20 filter that's probably made out of plastic to screw onto the front of it is like putting your camera in a Ziploc baggie and shooting through the baggie all the time so your camera doesn't get dust on it. You do not want to put low quality, cheap filters in front of high quality glass. I promise you it will just degrade the image quality that you're getting. If you're convinced that you need a UV filter to protect your lens, then spend the money and get a high quality filter so that you're not damaging your image quality. And yes, you're gonna pay more, but it's counterproductive to put a cheap filter in front of a really expensive lens. I will put some links to some high quality UV filters in the description box below this video. And if you really want to use a UV filter, please at least get one that's made out of the high quality glass that your lens is made out of, so you're not sacrificing image quality. Okay, sorry, that's just one of my pet peeves. Anyways, on the front of the lens, You'll also have the manufacturer's name, and sometimes it will say if it's capable of macro. Macro is basically just close-up photography, which means your lens is able to focus at really short distances. You also may find other letter combinations like IF, which stands for internal focus. This is typically always on the higher-end professional model lenses, which use what's called ultrasonic motors for focusing. This is basically a very high-speed motor that is built into the lens itself, to allow high speed focusing. On Nikon, this is signified by the letters AFS. On Canon, it's signified by the letters USM. Also, some of the lower end entry camera models like the D3200 or the D5200 do not have focusing motors in the camera. So you need to have an AFS lens for those cameras in order to use autofocus. This is very important, so I'm gonna say it again. 
If you have an entry level camera from any manufacturer, you need to check and see if they have a focus motor inside the camera because chances are they do not. And if that's the case, you need to buy a lens that has the focus motor built in. Also, like we talked about in the DSLR camera buying guide, how the lower end cameras have smaller DX sensors. Well, some lenses are made for these DX cameras specifically, and they will have a DX on them to signify that. The professional lenses, which are made for the higher end FX cameras, will work on both FX and DX cameras. But if you try to use a DX lens on an FX or professional camera, then you'll see a cutoff around the edge of the image as you zoom all the way out. Okay, now let's take a look at the focus ring. This is the ring that's closest to the end of your lens and you spin this ring to change the focus. If you have a manual focus lens, then this is how you focus all the time. There are usually always numbers associated with this ring that show you the distance of your focus on a scale from infinity down to the closest distance your lens can focus. This is usually represented in both meters and feet. Now back a little further on the lens is the zoom ring. This is how you zoom in and out through the focal range of your lens. Then further back you have the dot, which you line up with the dot on your camera to mount and unmount the lens. When mounting a lens onto your camera, do not ever try to force the lens. It should always slide easily into place with a click at the end to know that it's locked in place. And when unmounting the lens, try and keep a lens cap on both the back of the lens and on your camera body to prevent particles from damaging the back glass of the lens or the sensor in your camera. And when cleaning a lens, don't just clean it with your shirt. Sometimes if I'm in a rush, I'll just breathe on the lens and then wipe it off with a lens cloth. But there are special items out there that are made to clean lenses and I'll put a link in the description box below where you can find some. That's what I recommend and that's what I use to clean my lenses. Now, you don't want to clean your lenses too much because the lenses are coated with nanoparticles that are there to help improve the image quality. And you may risk rubbing off some of the coating if you clean it too often. So try and only clean your lenses when absolutely necessary. Now, some lenses may have switches on the side. These switches do different things. Some turn on and off the autofocus in your camera and others will activate the image stabilization within your lens if it's equipped with that. Image stabilization is exactly what it sounds like. It is an internal device inside your lens which counteracts hand movements and helps stabilize the image. This is known as VR in Nikon lenses for vibration reduction and it's shown as IS in Canon lenses. Some Sigma lenses also have this and it's shown as OS on the lens. Now, lastly, at the very back of your lens on some of the older lenses, you'll have the aperture ring. This manually controls the size of the aperture. Now, one last thing you may see on some of the high-end professional lenses are buttons up near the front, which allow you to lock the focus. By pressing this button down, this disengages autofocus. So if something happens to come between you and your subject, your autofocus won't change. Now that we've looked over zoom lenses from top to bottom, let's move on to prime lenses. Prime lenses are lenses that only have one specific focal length. So to zoom with these lenses, you must physically move your human back and forth while simultaneously burning calories. Sounds awful, I know. Prime lenses are great because they're always really sharp and they usually have really wide apertures to let lots of light in. Most of the time, prime lenses are smaller in size as well. So what they lack in magnification, they make up for in aperture size, image quality, and overall lens size. These lenses force you to be more creative. And due to the larger aperture, they also give you a great depth of field and beautiful bokeh. Bokeh is the term that's used for background blur in your image. So the part of the image that's real creamy and blurry is referred to as bokeh. And that's how it's supposed to be pronounced, people. Kind of like okay, except with an e eh on the end and a b up front. So bokeh, say it with me, bokeh. Not boke or bokey or boka. It's boke. Now you'll hear it said a thousand different ways by every photographer in the world. Boka, boke, boko, boka, boke, 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 bokey, boka, boka, bok, he, boke, okay, boke. But I personally spent 60 years on a spiritual quest in the ancient Japanese Nikon Mountains and I found an old man who told me how the word came to be. Or actually, I may have just done my research and found the correct way to say it. That's probably what really happened. Okay, so prime lenses have one focal length, superior image quality, 
and wide apertures for great low light performance and beautiful bouquet. Now, we're not really gonna go into the construction or physics of the interworkings of these lenses because it's insanely complex and not really something that you need to know. Now, one thing that you may need to know is that the circular glass components inside the lenses are what's known as elements. Every lens has multiple elements, and this just means that there are several different sized pieces of glass in the lens which are bending light in particular ways to achieve the focal length in that lens. So, glass in the lens are called elements. Got it. Okay, so I may have missed some stuff, but that's the essential things about lenses that you need to know. Now, get ready for what's gonna help you out the absolute most when you're starting out. The DSLR Lens Buying Guide. The DSLR Lens Buying Guide is the second part to this two-part lens series, and that will be out very soon. So, be sure to subscribe and check out our other videos, and thanks for watching. Love you, bye.